Okay, so let's go back to 1940 and assume you are a trustee or a member of the selection committee and you've selected Benjamin Mays to be the next president of Morehouse College. So what is it you think you were getting and what is it you got? I give you Randall jokes. Uh, first of all, for all of you Morehouse men, I am not a Morehouse man. Amen. Amen. It's okay. And neither was Benjamin Mays. He went to Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. Uh, and um, uh, if you ever go up to Bates College, I don't know if any of you all have been to Lewiston, Maine. Uh, Lewiston, Maine ha is known for two things. Uh, the second Sonny Liston Muhammad Ali fight and Benjamin Mays uh, are the two things that uh, <laughs> Lewis and Maine is uh, known for. So I, how I came to, uh, to think about Benjamin Mays, I want to give you briefly that. Uh, I was a student at the University of Michigan in uh, civil rights history class with uh, a late historian, um, a man by the name of Harold Cruz. And he wrote a book called The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. And uh, Cruz was quite, quite the curmudgeon, and uh, in, we each had to select a topic, and so I decided I was going to try to think about the intellectual origins of Martin Luther King Jr., and, and we had to write out our little paper topics, uh, and uh, Cruz said to the class, well, Randall Jelks is going to write about Negro preachers uh, to, to the class, and that began a, a journey. A journey with uh, uh, Mays because Mays was mentioned by nearly everyone. I mean, Vernon Jordan, Marion Wright Edelman, uh, John Hope Franklin, and I sat and talked for hours about Mays because Mays, John, Dr. John Hope Franklin told me, like, you know, I never went to chapel at Fisk. But when Benjamin Mays came to Fisk, somehow I made my way to chapel. So, I was fascinated that such a figure it was mentioned everywhere. Uh, when I would go visit my great aunt's seniors building, uh, uh, I, when I was doing the research, uh, they would say, well, what you working on? I said, well, I'm, I'm writing this uh, research on Benjamin Mays. And then they say, well, you know Dr. Mays wrote in the Chicago Defender. You know Dr. Mays wrote for the Pittsburgh Courier, and on and on and on. So here was a giant. Now, had he been president of Harvard University, he would have been well known and, and have been 25 books about him. There are only two right now about Mays. But if he had produced the same quality of people uh, that uh, over his tenure at Harvard, there have been thousands of books of what kind of educational genius it is. So I want to give you briefly about one of the things that concern Mays a great deal. Mays was a, a PhD from the University of Chicago Divinity School. Uh, there's a great joke about the University of Chicago uh, Divinity School where God goes to die. Um, uh, and Mays was a, a, a philosophical uh, uh, thinking person, uh, and he grew up uh, in uh, Effworth, North Carolina. And most of, uh, most of us know, uh, for at least young students, uh, that Mays is buried on Morehouse's campus. The body, his body, and Sadie Mays' bodies were moved onto campus. Uh, but that's kind of where it stops. Uh, uh, so, and, and he's the statue in front of Graves Hall there at, uh, at, at, uh, 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 at Morehouse. Uh, but his, uh, and that he served uh, for 27 years as president and, uh, of, uh, of Morehouse College. Um, and that's pretty much where it stops with young, young students. But more, Mays um, reinvigorated what it meant to be a Morehouse man, right? I mean, from style to clothing to wearing his Phi Beta uh, Kappa uh, pin on his side, uh, he wanted people to know. But he started really in humble beginnings in Ethworth, South Carolina. And he was born in 1894. Now, this is the actual house. They made it look good at the museum site. I wish they wouldn't have, because if the original house, it was 
um, all the house was uh, wallpaper with newspaper. And that was the sharecropper's design. And it sat on the middle of the side of the road when I first went to see it, before they finally bought it and moved it into the Greenwood, South Carolina. Uh, and it was a sharecropper's home. And he was the youngest kid. And his father, of course, needed a hand. And he wanted his brothers to uh, be fill uh, hand. His father was a, uh, a little higher scale. He was a tenant farmer as opposed to a sharecropper. There, there's a distinction. In a tenant farmer, you own your tools, your animals, and other stuff. Uh, sharecropper, everything is given to you. But it was still a horrible, horrible existence because you just couldn't make anything. And this is where he grew up. And his father didn't want him to go to school. Very simple. He said, well, okay, I, I let you go to, uh, uh, I let you go to uh, fifth grade. That's enough. Aren't you uh, tired of school? You just got to come out here working in this field. And he kept insisting that he go to school. And, uh, uh, and his mother actually took his place uh, behind the mule uh, so that the youngest uh, could go, go to school. And he makes his way through eighth grade. South Carolina, like many of our southern states, didn't have high school for black uh, kids. You couldn't go to high school. So he had to go to South Carolina State University. That was where the high, high school was in Orangeburg. Um, and he cleaned out houses and painted them. Uh, and you know, you know how it is. It, you know, high school is high school no matter what it is. You know, people are talking, making you shame because you got to paint the outhouse or, but he did it. And he finally got a job as a Pullman Porter. And, and I have this wonderful picture in the book uh, when he buys his first brand new suit. You know, uh, and uh, you, you see this uh, uh, person with this incredible uh, determination. Uh, but one of the things that he says that sustained him is the church. And he's not, um, he's not touchy-feely about the, the, the black church. Uh, but he says, this is an institution that has sustained uh, black people when no other institution has. So from the late 18th century, African Americans reshaped Protestantism uh, to suit their own needs as oppressed people. Uh, that where, whereas we couldn't own anything else, we couldn't own this building or other buildings downtown Atlanta, we owned our spirit. We owned uh, 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 and, and for South Carolinians and Virginians and Louisiana, uh, we built uh, a network of black churches all over the country. And, and it's very important because I think uh, today I ask all my young activists, uh, friends in Black Lives Matter, uh, how are you going to support yourself? What's your network? Where are your meeting grounds uh, that you own independently? All these little uh, small black churches were the sites of where black people could gather on their own, out, out of the way. And so we created a, a network. And, th and this network was international. Black Baptists, as well as others in the AME, created an international network, uh, created uh, around the country. Uh, those churches became national and international, mm -hmm. educational, faith, feminist, performance, social justice, and uh, social mobility networks. Think about where your Prince Hall Masons met. Think about where your Eastern Star met. Those are networks. Now, some of, some of you young people, maybe don't, you, know, you don't know about those groups. Uh, but they were very, very important in the lives of, of people, uh, uh, networks of how to get a job, how to move to another city, uh, and who, who to get in contact that was good for you. So maids began to think about this because all along the rural landscape, black churches were all along the rural landscape. And they were meaningful for people. And this is how maids moved to get an education. His minister said to another minister in Orangeburg, I got this smart little boy. And he's coming to you all over here. And what, what are we going to do for him? And so for him, um, he uh, uh, said, look, I could have been a lawyer, but I think I'm going to go into ministry. Um, and, uh, and from ministry, I'll go into education. The other side is that we had all of these rural churches, 
But by 1910, we really began to see the shape of these large urban churches, black churches. These were, again, institutions. Um, we often forget that, uh, that religious organizations are not just um, 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 uh, spiritual houses. They are also organizations. And those, again, those network. This, is, uh, this photo you can't see well is Abyssinian uh, when uh, they are burning the mortgage. Um, um, uh, a church that may have spent, as a graduate student, a lot of time in, in Chicago, Olivet uh, Church, uh, Lacey Kirk Williams, who was the head of the National Baptist Convention. Uh, these networks, uh, however, however shabby, however uh, uh, we might think they are, however, uh, were the networks that African Americans used as a source of power. So Mays, as a graduate student, begins to think that how can we get black churches to organize, not against each other. Because you know, uh, back in the day, there were a lot of debates about theology. Black people love to talk about theology, still do. I was in the barbershop the other day listening to a theological debate. <laughs> All right, uh, and, and it was, it's, it's wonderful. But May said, look, we need to have a cooperative system by which we learn how to move this institution toward creating, helping us create a system of social justice. Really pretty much produce that. So that's the aspect of Maze I wanted to talk to you about, and I'll take your questions. All right, great. Question. <laughs> my, my first question. Recollection, and it's been a few years uh, as a senior person in that. But I remember uh, Benjamin Liza Mays talking about 99 South Carolina. Uh, when does that fit into his? Oh, nine, uh, um, uh, yeah, Epworth is 96. Yeah. But truthfully, he's from Epworth. 96 was the closest town. Right? Like all my relatives from. Um, uh, 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 from Mississippi say they are, they're from uh, Crystal Springs. Well, it turns out they're really not from Christmas Spring. You know, that's the nearest post office. Yeah. <laughs> well, you live out in the roadside. Yes, sir. I'm a native of Atlanta, and I went to the White House. And Benjamin Mays had that unique ability to go across the aisle. And I think a lot of what happened in Atlanta was based on his ability to do that. But one thing that he did, I never really understood how it came about, was that he was able to form a relationship with Margaret Mitchell. Um, yes, he did. Uh, yeah. To get blacks to go to medical school, and she would do it, but nobody knew about it. Do you know how that relationship? Oh yeah, they use a he, they used a driver. He never went to see her, and she never came to see him. They had a driver. She had a black driver, and they were driving money back and forth. He held his nose about that one. You know, when you the you know, as Dr. Swagman knows, when you're the president of an institution, sometimes you got to hold your nose. And he hated God with the wind. He thought it was like it was a worse propaganda than uh, the the uh, uh, the birth of a nation, right? Because it was so much more romantic. He hated that movie, but he had students he needed to educate, and he talked her into it, exchanged letters. It took a while. It took a while. Yeah, right. But but he still hated that. He hated he hated everything about it. But he wanted to see students go go to school. Yes. Yes, sir. So, uh, you know, I find it fascinating that we're talking about uh, maids in, in that era. So we're now in the era of mega churches with uh, pastors like uh, Kurt Bogdala and things of that nature. Where do you see the modern African-American church in the context of what Mays was teaching in the 1930s? Well, I, I think those churches that I speak, Abyssinian and, of course, uh, Olivet, they were huge churches then. They, were, they, they were huge churches by any standard, even today, right? Um, Creflo Dollar um, and others uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, don't represent the average black church. Though. The average black church is 200 people with a working pastor. I mean, that really is the average black church. That, and that still is the average black church. Now, we got the exceptions, you know. Uh, in my day, you know, um, uh, in 
and when I was a theological student, I mean, my friend Jeremiah Wright had an extraordinary church uh, in Chicago. But that's the exception, that's not the rule. I mean, you, you still uh, dot Chicago or any other city, Atlanta, you're going to still see these smaller churches. And that really is the average. And 97% uh, of those are supported by women. Uh, we like to see the TV preachers. Uh, they look good. They got the cameras. But that's still not the average. And, and of course, what Mays was concerned about even then was those the, the, the average, not the, the, the extraordinary exception. Yes, sir? I'd like to hear <clears throat> your particular perspective on this particular situation. And that's with the churches today, African American churches. When they're ready to expand and build, they tend to go to the white folks or architects and construct. Now, they're building a symbol of who they are and it's all supported. Why is it that that happens? Well, I mean, why is it that uh, black people don't trust black lawyers or doctors or anything else unless some white person affirms that? I mean, we still are fighting the psychology that we are less than. I mean, we are still fighting that psychology uh, um, and, and that black professionals aren't to be trusted. Uh, we, we have to continue to uh, uh, fight that. Um, Black professionals, or whether you're in your business or not, you, you, you have to continue to be the highest level of professional you can be. Um, but we still fight that psychology. You know? I have black students like, I've never had a black professor before. Like, and, 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 and I teach at a majority white college campus. But I, you know, but I heard from my friend who was white that you're a good teacher. <laughs> I mean, you know, you you still are fighting this psychology. Uh, what? Really? Um, I, th I thought I got here for a reason. You know, but, but you do, you still have a psychology out there that um, that that uh, black professionals are less than, right? And we have to fight that, uh, and 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 uh, continue to, uh, to, uh, to to use that, and to continue. One of the things that. Uh, Mage was about was black power, that, not in the sense of the black power of you know you know um, um, God, uh, black power, but in the sense of of empowering people to do uh, what is uh, good for their community, and I think we uh, we still need that um, in our politics and in, in everything else. Pe I mean, people are scared to be advocates for a side when other people are advocates for their side, right? I mean, like, oh, I'm like somebody said. Well, I don't. I just don't represent uh, black people. I I represent all people. I'm like, well, look, uh, in this meeting, I'm representing black people, right? Okay, let's let's get to it. And we can we are, we have plural uh, plural interests in the United States, right? If we can have a crash president as we do, we ought to be able to say we represent black people. Right? <laughs> yes, Dr. Frank. Yeah, Dr. Joe, I just Express appreciation and admiration for your scholarship over the years. You have been an important voice in the <coughs> mainline American scholarly circles for keeping Dr. Mays' name alive. Thank you. you and Dr. Sam Archon Samuel Du Bois Cook Good. Yes. were the two among many others, but you are the leading figures for. Well, that's high praise. That's high time. So I just want to commend you for <laughs> yeah, that. Thank, thank you. And then uh, I want to ask a question, but sure. one other little historical footnote that. Some of this room may not be aware of this. Uh, in, you know, Dr. May came to Morehouse 1940, 15, 16, 17 years later. He's helping to give birth to a new black institution. Yes, he is. ITC. Yes. Precisely to educate black clergy who would respect each other and learn how to get along instead of competing. <coughs> in this movement of black ecumenism. Black Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, yeah. Pentecostal, Baptists, working together on the same camp. ITC was a genius. Yes, it was. Of an institution. And there was Benjamin, <coughs> I had pictures in my home. Benjamin Mays, Harry Richardson, yes. sitting there crafting this new institution and would give them economic viability yes. because they couldn't make it alone. Right. So I just wanted to note that again, part of his genius. 
as a historian, social scientist of black institutions, this boule is now capturing its history, and this particular chapter will be telling its story in a powerful way, I think, next year. Um, there's a lot of scholarship on black churches now. You've contributed to it. Black banks and businesses. Are there any black institutions that are under documented? Whose stories need attention? Just something you might challenge us to think about. Well, I, I think the black, black fraternal uh, and Greek culture in general uh, still needs the story told <coughs> so more. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I, that is still under told, mm -hmm. um, uh, or to versions of it are told. And I still think that uh, needs to, and of course, I still think uh, the long work of, of Masons and uh, 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 the Masonic uh, movements need to be told as, as, his, as, uh, as historical uh, institutions. Those are really under, under told. And the history of our many different colleges uh, need to be continued to, to be written. Uh, I think that we don't tell that enough. I'm working on a documentary film project on Langston Hughes. Uh, and of course, Langston Hughes went to Lincoln. Um, hey. and, yeah. <laughs> Which was uh, all men's college too at that time. Right? So, uh, but those stories around those schools, uh, he was there with Thurgood Marshall, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, president of Nigeria, uh, Ezekwe. Uh, they were all classmates together. You imagine that. Me. And, and uh, so, so these these institutions need a history for the students to say, "Wait a minute, I have a long history," and to tell the story of what we did without money. Because we didn't have. A, I mean, when I started reading about uh, Morehouse, I was like, "Okay, they were still making miracles happen without no money." You know, I mean. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and of course, uh, I was just telling uh, this distinguished colleague, um, my, my forebear, one of my forebears was sold by Georgetown University into Louisiana, keep it alive. So slaves, Brown University, uh, slavery, you know, all those institutions had long money. Some of it came out of blood money, right? right? Yeah. We were doing... <laughs> We're doing with you know people uh, sending in what they could, um, and I, I one of the most moving things that I found about the uh, uh, Mays story is that he and Mrs. Mays would hire young men to live at their house, the house boys, as they were called, and they'd clean up the house, polish up the house, polish up the tables, and and these men are doctors and lawyers and. And they, they, they tell, like, hey, I was a country boy, and they gave me an opportunity. And, and then they would sit me down with some dignitary, and Dr. Mage would expect me to go to the library and find a, have something to say to that person. So Dorothy Hyde is sitting at the table, and I'm supposed to say, uh, Mrs. Hyde, uh, you know, uh, I hear you doing this. What, what, that's mentorship. And we have to remind ourselves that we come from that long tradition of mentorship. Yes? Uh, I, I am aware Dr. Mays was an archon, uh, but I wonder if anybody or if you know what chapter was Dr. Mays in Dr. Mays? Was he an Atlanta archon? He was an Atlanta archon. Yeah. He was a member of Kappa when, when I was inducted, but I'm not sure. And where he was he was with Q. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, he was a kid. We were talking about real fraternity. That conversation will drift in ways. I don't know. <laughs> was he inducted as, as the president of Morehouse, or was was he a member of before? Or? Uh, he was, uh, I know he was a, 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 an Omega first. So, uh, but I, I don't know when he came uh, to, 
to, to be an archive. So all, all I know is it was inducted before 1978. Uh, because I checked with the Grand Office, and their records go back just that far. They asked me to check with the archivist. The archivist is still looking, didn't have to answer the question. Yeah, I, I, sure. but but I, I get that information. Too. Well, that's true. No, I think it was a Yes, sir, but honestly, in, in light of the recent burnings of black churches here in the South, how did, uh, and, and with the current administration we have, do you feel that we, we're going to be threatened for quite some time with these type of situations? Oh, I, I, I think uh, uh, these, this uh, situation is reminiscent of when Mays was born. Um, I mean, black churches were being burned. You know, black churches have been burned for forever. I mean, that's because that's it represents us as a central. Uh, uh, it's a symbol of who we are. Uh, and of course, uh, in Appaloosa, Louisiana, where uh, those three churches were uh, burned um, recently, um, uh, you know, why else? They they weren't threatening anybody else. They had been in that 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 town forever. It's very interesting that they burn uh, those black uh, territories because Appaloosa has a large black Catholic population uh, mm -hmm. as well. So it was very interesting that they chose uh, those those churches where people um, had uh, taken great pride, you know, in that um, uh, in St. Landry's Parish. There, uh, yeah, we are, we are we are we uh, once uh, a leader. Uh, presidential leader, and this is having Woodrow Wilson, um, uh, fans racism, it, it doesn't stop. And uh, so we're, we're in a better position today than ever to, to resist that. I mean, you know, uh, think about it, 100 years ago, people just uh, were burned out. I mean, think about it, the you know, whole city, Black Tulsa, was burned out. So, but at least we're in a better position today and it, it'll be a struggle when we have to face that. Uh, um, this is uh, unleashed because it turns people away from what what the real issue is. You know, poor white people. Du Bois said this in the 1930s in, in Black Reconstruction. He says, "Black white workers got the wages of whiteness." Right? That was a psychological comfort for them. And so you could be white, but you still grow. And you know, and you can't align with other people who might have similar interests to you, and that's what we're seeing today. So, yeah. Yes, sir. One last question: Do you think that poor, poor blacks, middle class blacks, or those who are means will be the ones to perpetuate the black church? How would it continue to? Yeah, that's a, that's that is the greatest question because, well, you know, black church has always been class based, right? I mean, we you know, let's face it, you know, um, you know, you. You had the, uh, upper, you know, and that's nothing wrong with that. I, I'm not uh, saying, but what what happened was people went across those lines to to reach out to one another, and that's still what how have to ha happen because it, you know, I mean, there are certain things that uh, uh, I'm sure you gentlemen. I was told by one of your members that males have 11 minute. Uh, uh, span, so I, you all don't need to hear the two-hour sermon anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got the point in at least 20 minutes. Uh, and so there are differences, and, and that's all right. Uh, as long as we name that as all right, not making judgment on other people who want two hours. You know, if that works for you, it works for you. But, uh, you know, I know all y'all need to get to the NFL draft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, right. so I think on that, now let's give a round of applause. Thank you, sir.